Hey there, and welcome to the Confident Woman Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Brooks. Join me as I sit down and chat with co-hosts, friends, and carefully curated guests and talk about all the things that empower you to become your best and most confident self. So let's get started. All right, ladies, welcome back to another episode of the Confident Woman Podcast. So today we have with us Deanna. Deanna Schober is wait till you hear her story because this is going to be an incredible journey. But Deanna is the co-founder of The Built Daily and co-host of the five-star rated Fitness and Sushi podcast alongside her husband, Tony. Together, they have helped thousands of women break the yo-yo diet cycle, get their health on track, and achieve their naturally healthiest weight by healing the relationships of food, their bodies, exercise, and their minds. So if you're obviously been listening to this podcast, these are conversations that we long to have because this is really just a hot topic that we battle with these, you know, the relationships really with ourselves from our bodies to the exercise. And a lot of it does stem from the education and the understanding of how to heal our bodies and have a loving and harmonious relationship with food from the inside out. So welcome, Deanna. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. And I am really looking forward to this conversation with you. I am too. I know we were just chatting just briefly before we hit record and we're just talking about some of the backstories because for every story, there's a backstory. And I know that you and your husband have an incredible story that you would love to share with our listeners. And really, that was the heart and the drive of creating this business, creating the podcast, creating everything from your own experiences. So I'd love to pass the mic off to you and just kind of dive in and share part of that story with us. Okay, well, it's... It's a long but worthy story. Like every step of it is wild. (laughs) So starting back with like I met, so my husband now who I run the business with and the podcast with is my second husband. I was married before to my older kid's father. That ended in divorce. I was very, at that point, I yo-yo dieted through that whole, like really since I was a child, since I I was 12, 11 years old, I had yo-yo dieted. But I ended that marriage feeling the way that it ended with like infidelity was devastating to me. It sent me into another yo-yo diet because I felt very unworthy and unattractive. I was the single mom going out into the world with three little kids. I already didn't feel like anybody was ever going to want me. And so after a lifetime of yoga dieting, I did what I always do and went on another diet. And it was at the tail end of that, of me having lost some weight that I actually met my husband. He was living overseas at the time and he was home. I was like, oh, like hot guy. And I will all, you know, like I'll just have some fun with him for a couple of weeks and he'll go away and I'll go back to my life as a, as a single mom. And that's not what happened. We had an overseas long distance relationship. And, you know, two years later, we're actually married. I didn't realize at the time that he was dealing with binge eating disorder and he had been since college. He was 27, I think, when I met him. So he'd been dealing with it for a good 10 years where he would follow the advice of like the figure competitors that would get on stage and like get judged for the look of their body. And he would diet down and he would follow their advice and do what they were doing. And then he would reach that goal and at some point would be like, I need a break. I need a cheat meal or I need a cheat weekend. And that would turn into a month of days that would go, they would start with like a little bit of extra food. And then that would be, it went all the way up to like 10,000 calories a day of food where he was putting on 30 pounds of weight at the end of that binge. And then he would think, well, you know, what's wrong with me? I'm so weak. I'm so, why did I let this happen? He would get really mad at himself. And then he would go back to the dieting and do it all over again, not putting two and two together at all. He just thought that this was a, a willpower problem of his. And so that's where he was at where I, when I met him. And then I was yo-yo dieting. I had in the past definitely dipped into anorexia at one point, like, you know, in like high school and the yo-yo dieting, I was, it was always on my mind. It was very disordered patterns, but nothing too severe. Well, the two of us coming together was, a disaster. I mean, it was great because he's a wonderful guy, but our eating disorders really kind of took hooks in one another and really blew up that situation for both of us. His got worse. Mine turned into something new. 
where I became obsessive about my health. There's no official diagnosis for this, but the word is orthorexia, where I became so obsessed with dieting my body down to a six pack and looking lean enough for him because I knew what he like was into. And so there was all this pressure on me, you know, the trauma of the divorce that I hadn't fully healed from, I guess at that point just really exasperated this whole problem. And so that was where we were when we met. And that was where we were when we got married. It was me at the tail end of really forcing weight off my body and getting a lot of attention for it, quite honestly, at the time. And him really, really struggling with the binge eating disorder. So we were able to, at some point, he sought help for the binge eating disorder. And we found out that what he was doing was trying to fix his eating by being you know, sober from food or trying to force himself to stop was actually making everything worse. That resonated with me because I was experiencing binging as well. It just wasn't happening as frequently as him. So we came together. This is such a long story. I'm sorry. We came together. We healed from, we healed from that together. We figured these things out on our own. We had at the time he had started a weight loss company and was at the top of Google. Everyone was, we were getting two million visitors a month, sold out coaching. And so as we healed, we decided that we needed to walk away from that. We didn't want to contribute to diet culture anymore and started the company that we have now where we walk our clients through the same healing process that we went through, not necessarily from eating disorders, but from yo-yo dieting because it's just another, it's disordered eating, disordered exercise packaged into you know commodity to sell to you. So we help our clients to heal from that the same way that we did. Wow, what a what a wonderful story. Just the transformation that I'm hearing took place in this. And, you know, you said it's a long story, right? But the point of that is, is that we're so multifaceted. There's so many different pieces that our unhealing parts of us have bled into and have trickled in. And so I love that you shared that. And I love that you brought your husband into this, into the space, because it shows that even though you are struggling with something, it can be a mirror and that's who we're attracting. We don't realize it. And so having some of that, those unhealthy relationships with our food, our body, and you know, so on, how it trickles in and recognizing that. And I give you guys like props for this because this is big because a lot of times you, with relationships, we see that it becomes a codependency upon each other where you were like, no, we're mirroring back and forth. And for us to heal and get better, we need to change this up. We need to do something different. So I love that you shared the inner parts of your of your story. And so, I mean, there's stories upon stories upon stories, right? And we're hearing this and we hear these triumphs and yet we're still hearing so many individuals struggle with it. And it gives us that, you know, a sense of compassion to say we have to go back and, and help lead those individuals because there's so much freedom from devices that allow us to grip over us if we don't identify that and begin to heal and let that go. So I love that the whole story brought everything together. So I feel like that was a really important part to set that tone. And so now you guys are on this track, you're healing, you're working through your food and body issues separately, but yet coming together from a place that says, let's do something about it. We created this business. It was at the top. This isn't who we stand for. We're only adding more harm to others out there. And if we're meant to be beacons of hope and possibilities for what is, you know, what life change or setting yourself free could be, how do we make that happen? So I'm curious to know how that took place for you. Obviously, you know, letting go of something that was built, it was beautiful, you know, something that you probably put a little bit of security in because that business had been a foundation to what you guys essentially brought you together. I mean, it was, and it also was supporting our family financially. Mm -hmm. So it was right. very scary, but something happened to me first where my dad died. My dad mm -hmm. passed away in 2016 and coming back to sitting down and working with people and being part of diet culture and, and realizing that like this is all kind of percolating at the same time where I was realizing that it wasn't just me. It was also the diet industry. It was perpetuating all the same things that made me, yes, I was very extreme about it, but it was also happening for the, the ordinary 
woman, every woman that I was speaking to on some part of the spectrum. And so coming back from his funeral where we had celebrated his life and we talked about all the best parts of life where he loved music and he loved being with his family, he loved his grandchildren, he loved his children. It was nothing to do with the size of his body and nothing to do with like money or any of those things that we think are going to bring us happiness in life and that we're sold the idea Mm -hmm. that it's going to bring us happy beauty and money and appearance and those kinds of things. It had nothing to do with that. At the end of his life, it was all about, I get choked up talking about this, this connection and experiencing life in your body, laughter and seeing sunrises and hugs and those kinds of things. It was just so clear to me at that point that that was what life was about and that I was on the wrong path. And yes, the financials were difficult and it was very scary to walk away, but I just trusted that if I did the right thing, that the universe would figure out a way to support us. And it has, 100% has. And in reality, when we made that decision, I made it first and then he kind of, we came together and he came along for that ride the core of our audience followed us and they wanted to heal with us. They were interested in what we were doing and we were, you know, we were always trying to stay two steps ahead of them. And so we could lead, but they came with us and they, you know, we've, they've stuck around for the most part. Well, that's incredible. It's, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to hear of your father's passing using loss for a gain. And I can relate to so much of what you're sharing. I had lost my brother. And so that scary. really, thank you. It, it had put that perspective because what you're sharing and for context, I was that person chasing perfection, the perfect body, the perfect life, the perfect everything. And I'm a former fitness competitor as well. I suffered from years of, I would just say like a lifetime of body dysmorphia, eating disorders, disordered eating, self-image, self-esteem, yo-yo dieting, all of that. And that had really stemmed from the roots. And so I had to do the healing. And this is why I'm really drawn to the story because through storytelling, it, it unites, right? It brings that, it helps close that gap and bring healing together. So even though like we could say we've healed, it's still that reminder that it's just a step away, right? Because we're always choosing that path day to day to make better decisions and intentional and live with, on, and for purpose. And I share that because that was a beautiful gift that my brother got to give to me and that, that gain from the loss. And so you're using the story from your your father's passing as a trajectory. It becomes now the fulcrum of this isn't living. What I was doing before was for all the wrong reasons. Let me make do of something that can really feel like I'm living with on and for a purpose, that I'm leaving a legacy, that I'm making a change, that if I can live my best quality of life, I want to do the same for others. And I love that your community was on board. They were just like, We came to you because we wanted the support. And if you're shifting gears and it's a way for you to improve, then we want a piece of that too. And so I love that you had that backing. You had the drive. And you said, staying two steps ahead in leadership and watching your community come up and follow you and being a witness to their own transformation has got to be one of the most fulfilling fulfilling rewards, right? Oh, my God. I mean... I knew when I made this this shift and they were starting to kind of show up and come along for the ride. And I I remember having a workshop that I taught mm-hmm. and they were there and I got off that workshop and I just have never experienced any. I'm sure you've had this experience too. You just know that you are doing what you were put on this earth to do. I felt it in every piece of me and I have never doubted, not for one minute since it made Everything, all the pain and suffering that I had gone through up until that point makes sense. And being able to walk people through the other side of this, I can't describe what it feels like to get a message from a client saying, like, I spent all day not thinking about food. And it's the first time in 20 years that I have not spent a day thinking about food or thinking about my body. And it makes it all worth it. And it is like fulfilling. It doesn't even begin to cover it. You know, it's just... It's an amazing, amazing feeling. Yeah. Wow. That, you know, for anyone listening, when you experience that feeling, it's the feeling that gives every bad day meaning and context to keep moving forward. 
It's where you just lights you up. Every fiber, every speck of you is just lit and comes alive. So that feeling is just really that edge that keeps you going. And so I'm curious to know, like as you're progressing through this transformational journey, you've changed the company, you changed the mission, you've you know had to let go of a lot of the past, the things that were holding you back. And so what were some of those identifiers in your own personal journey that were aha moments for you or some of those challenges that led to those breakthroughs? Well, I think that, you know, it's multifaceted. Mm -hmm. I think that the biggest aha moment that I had was that I could stop controlling myself, if that makes sense. I could stop trying to control myself and think of this as, I'm I'm pointing to my body, sorry, this is audio, (laughs) that my body is this thing that I have to control and to get under my command and start thinking of, I started to integrate my body and my mind and make it kind of my home. And my biggest thing was going from being this self-critical, self-hating, hard on myself person who was trying to micromanage everything that I ate, everything that I did, I know, like, just knowing that your background on the story that you can probably relate to these things Mm -hmm. because that's what the life is like. If you've ever watched, have you ever watched Physical on Apple TV? I caught the first episode, but yeah, that was definitely the the 80s and 90s jam about, you know, the leotards and the aerobics and the exercise. Yeah. Well, the thing about it that I found the most interesting was it was the most accurate portrayal of the inside of my head when I was mm-hmm. in, having an eating disorder. I have never, and it was almost too much to watch because it, it took me back to that place of that is what it's like. It's just the never Damn ending just- judgment of yourself and everyone around you and the micromanaging every bite and food. So that is my old life. And when I realized that I could approach myself like a loving caregiver and like my own best friends, like my own parents, like loving parents and and have that lens of myself instead, that I could still be really healthy and take really good care of myself physically without worrying about it being perfection and worrying about the way that it looks all the time and those kinds of things and doing it for other people just in general. And I think that a lot of that I've discovered was an armor, you know, that I had up. It was probably a trauma response, but I started to shed that armor and really just be dedicated to myself as a caregiver. And everything changed for me. You know, I have, I've stayed very healthy over the years. I think that's one of the most important things is it's not like I just like let myself eat chocolate all day and like make this change to where It was the opposite of that. It went from an outside in kind of a self-care to an inside out kind of a self-care. Yes. Oh my gosh, for real. Like that, taking that whole context and flipping it on its head where, you know, obviously sharing your your journey, my journey, it was the longing, this void that was longing inside. And so how I thought was best to fill that was to seek externally. I thought that if I had all those pieces put in place, all the, you know, it's pretty perfect life. It was just a mirage. It was a way to put a front up because I was too afraid for others to see the ugly mess that was inside that I suffered silently. And so very relatable here. Yeah. I mean, it's like from the inside, you don't know what the pain, the depths of whatever's happening. So on the outside, you just think if I have this perfect life, no one will will think anything less of me. They won't judge me because I'm constantly judging myself. That hypercritical mind, that's incessant chatter that's always telling you, it's not enough, you're not enough, put that piece of food down, why are you eating this, right? It's always going to tell you the meanest, most nastiest things. And I love that you said in your own healing journey, you said, I had to go back and love myself. I had to become my friend. I had to parent myself. And so I can relate to that as well. But For those that are listening, it's like, I don't really know what that means because I don't think that I had a parent to show me love or I didn't have somebody that poured love into me. So how does that look like for somebody who might be on the cusp and saying, sounds all well and good, but I have no role models or examples of how to. Can you help them out? Yeah, that's such a good point. (laughs) There's a lot of a lot of the reason that we're in the situations that we're in is because we didn't have that role model, right? 
you know, we, we, I had a workshop once and I actually had women write down all the mean things that they say to themselves. And then I had them, I surprised them and said, turn to your partner and tell them those things, like say that to them as if you're saying it to them. And not one of them could do it. They all started crying as soon as it hit them. And I was like, and now close your eyes and imagine saying these things to your children. So we, it, we could wake ourselves up in those situations and realize like we are actually, if we were saying these things out loud to another person, we would be accused of verbal abuse, mm-hmm. emotional abuse. And so it's like, you have to kind of wake up and become aware of the things that you're saying to yourself. And that was really, I always thought that I was being hard on myself because that's how I could motivate myself. And that's the misinterpretation of that moment. It is short term, you know, you might be able to motivate yourself in the short term, but in the long term, it's just misery. And it actually leads to depression and that downward spiral of not making changes. But when I realized that it was actually more effective to talk to myself more positively, I started to think about what would I say to someone that I love and my best friend? And I think that for most of us, even if we didn't have a role model, we kind of know what we would say. And it's like, maybe a little bit of tough love sometimes, a little bit of like, you know, I know you don't want, yeah, this is what I would say to my kids. I know you don't want to brush your teeth, <laughs> but you need to go brush your teeth. I know you don't necessarily want to sit down and plan out what you're going to eat this week and make those preparations for yourself so that you have nourishment and satiation and satisfaction, but you need to do, you need to do that. So it's not just like, where I am just coddling myself all the time either. It's like, what would a best friend who had your best interest in heart say to you? And I try to channel that. And that's my new inner voice of, I had a client once who said that she started calling herself Buttercup when she talked to herself. And I thought that was the cutest thing I'd ever heard. And it just like, I tell tell all my clients that because it just, imagine if we all said things to ourselves in our head, like, but we prefaced it with Buttercup. (laughs) Buttercup? You need to get to sleep, buttercup. I just think that that's so sweet. And so it really changes things. And it feels very weird at first and very non-normal and very uncomfortable. And so it takes practice. And I think that what will happen is that you start to realize that you are more motivated to change. You are more motivated just in life in general with that voice. And you start to realize I mean, I think that once I started doing that and then I thought back to what it was like to live with a toxic, abusive self-critic, I don't want that anymore. Now that I'm away from it, it feels like a toxic relationship that I don't want to ever go back to. And I love the new, you know, healthy voice that I'm living with on a day-to-day basis. And so it's self-motivating to keep doing it. Oh, for sure. And I think, you know, we can tear ourselves down in a moment and it's so hard to build ourselves up, especially at the beginning of, you know, this change, because like you said, it's, we're so used to what was that anything outside of that feels very uncomfortable. It doesn't even feel like it resonates. It feels very foreign. Like, you know, if you give yourself some self-love, self-affirmations in the mirror, it's like, Ooh, that's weird. But then two seconds later, you're like, you know, your chatter's like, you're so stupid. Why would you even say that? Blah, blah, blah. Right. Mm-hmm. It, it's the same voice. Right. Yeah. And so now it's like, you got to discern which is the truth, which one's a lie. And obviously the lie is the one that's trying to tear you down. And that's the one that has essentially had the power and control over you. So when you realize like, no, I'm in the driver's seat, we can shift that gear. So if I'm listening to this negative lie, then I could flip the script and start reframing that narrative and speaking truth and life back over me. And that's how we begin to heal is because we're pouring in, right? Truth and life is love. It's love and existence. And it's like we were doing this. So We're healing from the inside out. And now you and your husband have ventured off. You started your own business. And what is the new business called? Like, can you give us a quick recap of what that looks like? Yeah, it's called Built Daily. That's the name of our of our company. We have something called the mentorship program where we help women who have been affected by diet culture and yo yo like the symptoms usually are they're yo yo dieters and they are some they think about food all the time. They're thinking about their bodies all the time. They're always looking up the latest way to lose weight. They're, it's taking up the majority of their life. They're good for, you know, I quotes, good for a while on a diet and then they fall off the wagon and back and forth, back and forth. That's the typical and usually over the age of 40 because I think that 
most of our clients are in their 50s and 60s because that is like when it was the worst. Like diet culture was really the worst and, and really got its hooks in people in like the 80s and 90s, like we were mm-hmm. saying. And so they are really haven't really been exposed as much to body positivity and anti-diet culture and those kinds of things that are that are happening right now. So we help them. We help them to heal, to understand what dieting has done to their relationship with food, has done to their relationship with exercise, with their body, how it's changed their mindset, to help them understand themselves and why they are self-sabotaging and doing the things that, that they're doing. And it all comes from a really loving place. We teach them to love themselves and we teach them how to how to make decisions about food that aren't black and white, how to nourish themselves without feeling restricted and deprived and to take care of themselves from a really healthy, loving place. We do that through, you know, one-on-one coaching. That's my thing. And then group coaching, we do those things together. And it's really, it's magical. It's magical seeing women heal from that stuff. Oh, for sure. And I love the name of your company, Built Daily. Can you just give us a quick little little story of how that came about and the use of those two words? Yeah, it was like, I think that the lifestyle that we're trying to create is to get out of, you know, we were all about weight loss. And it's like, I go on a plan and at the end of this plan, it's like three months, six months, whatever. And then I have this outcome and then I'm in maintenance and like that whole thing. We started thinking of healthy habits as something that you just wake up and do every day because you take care of yourself. Instead of that whole momentum, I'm checking the boxes off that tends to get us into a lot of trouble. It's a mindset that is not sustainable. It's more about just waking up every day and thinking of self-care almost as an art form. What's the best thing for me today? And just to be more present is really what Built Daily is all about. It's about being present. Mm, I love it. Because if you think about it, then we're not competing against the person we were or the person we're becoming, but if the focus is in the here and now and we're focusing on building daily habits, daily routines, yeah. daily practice, daily progress, right? I love that because it puts everybody in that, in the here and now, in the presence, because that's really the goal is how we create our future is in the present here and now. And if we're focused so far in advance, we're not doing the healing steps of the daily practice that, like you said, having something to kind of bookend your day. So love the name. I love where your whole business is going. And so now just kind of we're, we're navigating this journey with you and Built Daily comes about. You and your husband are at the top of your games. You're feeling, you know, we're healed, we're healing, and we're bringing others up in community to heal them as well. And so Walk us through the rest of that. Like, how does that look for your clients? Some of those wins that that your clients will definitely start seeing as they're going through this journey with you. I think the number one thing that we hear is like, I came to this because I was sick of thinking about food and my body and I'm leaving here like loving myself. And that is just the most unexpected thing. It's like I come in because I'm struggling with my weight for my whole life and I'm leaving with a completely new outlook on life. It's a complete transformation away from like I was saying earlier, we try to facilitate that same transformation that we had from self-controlling, there's something wrong with me that I need to fix, to I'm just going to strip away all of the crap that has been told to me through society over the years and get rid of all of that and figure out what I need and to create that for myself. And so that is the biggest change. I think I hear freedom I hear food freedom a lot. I hear freedom from obsession over bodies, freedom from obsession over food is, you know, probably the biggest change is freedom from emotional eating. So Tony and I kind of went back and recreated our own process and what helped us to heal. And we're also, as we worked with clients, we were also learning, you know, anecdotally what works, what doesn't work, what they need, what they don't need, and always kind of mastering that down into a system that we could walk them through. And so that's what we do in our in our mentorship program. And we take them through four relationships, food, body, exercise, and mind. And we help them to heal, to create new, more empowering belief systems around those things or help them to have the skills to navigate anything and really just walk them through that journey, however long it takes. And we always say this is not a quick fix. It's not like other programs have been in the past. 
we've been encouraged by so many business coaches to make it like a, a two, three month program. And I just won't do it because I, I feel like that's, <laughs> it's just, I, I can't imagine trying to get somebody through this process in two, three months. But six months, I always say this is just a boot camp because it's, it is a lifelong journey. It's one that I'm still on. I'm still only two steps ahead of my clients. You know, like it's, as you probably know, you, when you're in recovery from those things. And so you're always having to watch out for triggers. You're always having to watch out for old patterns to come back and to, to make sure that you're making your own best with your own best interest at, at heart with the decisions that you're making. So we just want to support them through that. And we want to be able to walk them to the other side of that and help them to find that same freedom and liberation. Mm, I love it. I love it. I love it. It's this whole journey. And you already know exactly what and how you're leading your clients knowing, listen, I'm not even going to take your money for a two, three month program. You're going to need it longer. So I'm not going to set you up for a short win for a quick fail because that momentum needs to keep going with you. So stick through the program, stick with us, stick with our community and having your clients feel that constant support and in knowing that you genuinely have their best interest at heart. And I think that that is commendable because we do see so many fitness coaches out there in the industry. Well, clearly, because we wouldn't be talking about this. We wouldn't even have these conversations if this noise wasn't still a factor and a real deal. It's just louder and in more places now because back in the day, it's, you know, you talk about the show physical. So we had the TV, then you had magazines and media. Now it's social media and it's, it's everywhere you look. There's this aesthetic which is considered worthy, acceptable, loved, like, right? So we're, when we're measuring ourselves up against that, we feel this big gap. And that's kind of what triggers some of our responses and leads us back into that relapse. So I can relate to this all too well. I mean, and I say this now where it's like, I haven't dieted in like seven ish years, which is a lifetime for me because I went all these decades with dieting where it felt like, what is life without? And like you said, it's every day is a choice where you're still battling it. There's days, for example, just recently, I didn't eat what I would consider well. And the thing is, I don't label myself anymore. I don't say I had a bad day or I had a cheat day or I just went off on the, I had a day. It just happened. And there was no judgment. And I remember slamming a bag of chips and I'm thinking about this. It's like, yeah, I shouldn't be eating this handful. Hand goes in, eating the chips, eat. You know, right? So you're doing the thing, but the difference between pre and post is that you had the control, you had the awareness and just said, listen, it's one day. It's not going to damage me in the whole grand scheme of things. I just listen to my body. Some days you just want to binge and just have a fun mm -hmm. day. But then there's other days you're like, let's just pick it up on track. And so it's going with the yin and the yang, the zig and the zag, right? So allowing yourself that flexibility and freedom to experience and have fun with food. And not look at it as that vice and that grip, but you get to now tell the food like, hey, we're going to eat this because we really enjoy it. We're going to eat this because you know what? Who cares? We want to, right? And so now you're ex opening that door for acceptance. And so your clients, I'm sure, are very similar at this part. They're like, what else can I add to my plate? What else can I do, right? So it sparks that curiosity, like, give me more. And on that more is that edge of like, this is what life is living. Instead of feeling like you're constantly in this vortex of like soul sucking energy where your food has the power over you. I love yes. what you're doing. Oh my God. And you just said it all so perfectly. I mean, and I know that's because you've recovered. And once you recover, you know what it's like. It's so, I just, I tell this to my, when I'm doing breakthrough calls with new clients, I'm always like, I just wish so much that I could just take this and transfer it into your brain so you could know how worth it this work is because it's hard. It's hard to Thanks. get in there and strip away those to reprogram and to do things differently and change your thought patterns. That's hard. But my God, on the other side of it is so worth it. Like getting to walk into a restaurant and just order what you want to order and not having to like obsess over what's going to do to my weight. Those things are so priceless and so we take for granted how much mental energy it is sucking out of our lives and really affecting our quality of life, those things. And I know that like health issues also can affect your quality of life, but that's not the answer either. It's not to replace one set of problems with another set of problems. There is this middle ground that is beautiful where 
you can prioritize your nutrition and you can also still enjoy your life and just like also be free and not have the grip. The I love that word, the grip, the vice over you. So true. For sure. And it's, you know, I would love to hear your take on, you know, because you lived on both sides of the spectrum, right? So you were all, you know, you were a victim of the food crisis here where it's like, well, no, we got you. We got you. And now you're on the other side. You're like, no, 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 I, I let that go. I'm good. And so what was some of the biggest, like, I know it's probably at the beginning of your journey where you were in those ahas, like, this is what's possible. So what was something that you recognized for yourself and that what kind of gave you that edge? Like, oh my God, this is incredible. I want to keep going. I remember this so well. And it was the first time that I realized how much I had been under eating at regular meals and how much that was affecting my binging and my snacking. I thought that I was like obsessed with food because every time I couldn't walk through the kitchen without grabbing cereal, grabbing crackers at nighttime, I would like be through going through the kitchen. What can I eat? What can I eat? And I thought that there was something wrong with me. And I thought it was a psychological problem that was I had a willpower issue. And when I realized that all I had to do was eat more at my meals, like not eat these little diety 300 calorie meals, that I would just stop thinking about food so much. Like that was it. And just that little shift did so much for me. That was a huge moment. Another huge moment was, like I said a minute ago, realizing I was sitting down at a restaurant with my husband and I realized how long it had been since I had stressed out over what I was going to eat and that it was just like, "Mm, this looks good and go. And sometimes it's salad. Sometimes it's a burger. Sometimes it's a quesadilla, like whatever. And it just, there's no stress over it anymore. And I think that that was a really big turning point for me too, was just realizing that this had been such a big, oh, and here's another one. (laughs) I thought that when I let go of the vice grip that I had on my food, that I was going to gain like 50 to 100 pounds and I was ready to do it because I didn't care. I couldn't live that way anymore. And, you know, I was always kind of like fluctuating when I was binging and restricting. And I just stayed at the top of the fluctuation and I've maintained that weight for 10 years. So that was also very surprising. Yes, yes, yes. You brought up a great point. When Okay, so let's take a second here to backtrack. When we come to this space, we feel like we need to be less, right? Like eat less, do more, like all this stuff so that the smaller we are, the more worthy we are. Like, you know, diet culture just tells you to be thin and just keep going thin. And if you can have more weight to lose, keep doing it, right? So it just sends you down this rabbit hole that is just unattainable to ever achieve. But you make a really great point because this is something that I was like wholly freaked out. When I first I got on my way, I said, listen, I, the one thing I hadn't done at this point was hire a fitness coach. And she helped me with my nutrition and my programming and kind of working co- together with you know proper lifting and, and diet and all that stuff. And her whole thing was, I'm not going to give you a meal plan. I'm going to go teach you how to educate yourself, learn about food, learn about the nutrition, the values, and all this stuff. And I was like, "Mm, ah, that's really hard. But it was that learning curve. Oh, it was terrible because I was like, no, just give me the quick fix. I'm I'm sick of struggling, Mm -hmm. right? So she gave me my calories and I was, I got it. My eyes opened as big as it could be. My jaw hit the floor and I was just like, there's a mistake. You realize I'm only 5'1". Like, why? This is an abundant amount. She goes, trust me. Clearly, Rachel, if you knew what you were doing, you wouldn't be here asking me for help. And I said, "Mm, (laughs) all right, I'm going to swallow my pride. I'm just going to go, okay, I'm going to do my thing. The amount of calories that I had to consume was actually such a challenge for me to eat for the probably the first month. So my first month at that point was just to get to that baseline. And I was struggling so hard because one, it was a lot of food that it felt like I had to eat like 17 different meals throughout the day just to consume that. And as I'm building up this momentum to hit my calories, I realize now how the additional calories played into my role of just existing. I felt more vibrant, more energetic. My lifts were stronger. I had more confidence in the sense that I can withstand my weightlifting or just getting through the day without having brain fog and feeling just tired and run down. And having that surplus of calories and how it affected my physical body and the weight, it didn't. I actually ended up losing weight because I hit that plateau because I was so malnourished, under hitting my calories. 
And the biggest fear was seeing that number and thinking that that was going to make me fat or explode and put me in all the wrong directions. So those that are listening, please, please, please do not be afraid to eat and eat to what your body needs. If those numbers and those calories seem so far off from what you've currently been eating, or maybe you have no idea what you've been eating because you just sporadically just grab and not really track or manage, the difference that you'll feel from the inside out from actually taking care of your body from a calorie perspective, but also focusing on that nutrient perspective, which of course, I know that you talk at great lengths about through your clients and teaching them that it's not just about the calories and it's not just the ins and outs of calories in and calories out and moving your body. So do you have any sort of like, what would you say to that woman who is kind of on that cusp and she's like, listen, I'm just trusting you. This is scary. This is a place that I've never been before. So that individual is already feeling like they've let themselves down their failure. So how could you regain that trust in themselves and in you to let them know you're in safe hands? Because this is really the outcome that we all want for you, right? And that's the number one thing I'm up against because Mm -hmm. they have been on diet after diet after diet. And the diet has told them that they have failed. Not that, that the diet failed them, but that they were the failure. I explained to one woman on a breakthrough call once that she had been working with a coach and she was already starting to ghost the coach. She's trying to lose weight. She just couldn't do the things that the coach was asking her to do. And I said, you have been asked to drive through an intersection, but there's a wall in the middle of the intersection and your coach is on the other side, doesn't see the wall. And maybe they don't have issues with food. Maybe they do and they've just ignored it, but whatever. You're being asked to do something impossible that you are not psychologically capable of sustaining. None of us are with the way that this was laid out. And so every time you've been on a diet, that's really what you're being asked to do psychologically is because there's so much to this and I could go on and on about it, but dieting goes against our psychology. It goes against our body's uh, survival system. It goes against our primitive survival system. Our body goes into famine mode. We seek more food. It's set up against us. So you're being asked to do something impossible, drive through an intersection with a brick wall. And so once you see that that, that method is the same thing over and over and over and over again. You know, I, it's different. This is not that. This is not dieting. This is healing that relationship, getting rid of that wall by taking it down brick by brick by brick. And then you can drive through the intersection with the right tools and the right, the right guidance. And it is, that's probably the, the biggest thing I'm up against is that women don't trust themselves anymore because of that. And so I do everything that I can to ensure that they'll get to the other side and that I'll be able to lead it through them, including like a guarantee, because I do feel so strongly about it. But that's that's all I can do. It, and a lot of the times the doubt wins and the doubt takes people back on diets and back into diet culture, which breaks my heart. But I have found that most of the women who sign up and go on this journey with me are at the end of their rope. They have hit that rock bottom. They're no longer on the fence. They know they're like me. Anything is better than what I have been living, you know, all this time. So rock bottom is a great place to start going forward and start going back up. It really is. You know, it's an ugly, lonely place, but it's really the best place to start because (laughs) you have nowhere else to go but up, right? And you know that this pain of sitting in this bottom is like, well, this sucks and I can't get any worse because it's here. So I know that you have an incredible resource and a tool to help those individuals. And I'd love for you to share a little bit more about that and, of course, how they can access it and and learn more about you as well. Yeah, so we have a free assessment. So I didn't say this, but we call our system the ideal body formula. And your ideal body is not your perfect body. It's not your goal body. It's the body that you're in when you have healed your relationship with food, body, the exercise and mind. So whatever that looks like, it's, you know, it might be called your healthiest weight, but mentally and physically, those two things come together. We have an assessment so you can see like where you're at with your relationship with food, with body, with exercise and mind, and we'll spit you out a little number to kind of give you an idea of where you're at. And then once you do that, we'll show you some emails or sorry, some videos and send you some emails that will explain what that means and how you can get some help. And that is builtdaily.com slash confident. Oh my goodness. So guys, definitely take advantage of that. It's going to be in the show notes. And I love that you have your own version of that. So you're like, 
you know, we're not going for perfection. We're not going for a standard image. We're going for what you feel is a version of your best and healthiest self. So it's like that individual gets to create it in the here and now. And they get to focus on building those daily habits and being a part of this program that literally walks them through this journey to that ideal version of who they want to become. So you and your husband are doing some incredible work. It's so needed. We need more voices. We need more advocates. We need more individuals like you guys. And in us just having these conversations that are just helping to normalize that we're all in this, we're all struggling. And even though your journey is unique to you, it's not unique in that sense that when we come to a whole diet culture, it's an epidemic. It's happening. It's hurting people that they don't have that insight awareness or understanding of how to get themselves out because every desperate cry pulls on another thing. You need this, you need that, you need this, right? And so it's just basically grasping at straws in the darkness of this pit where you're teaching them, I'm giving you an opportunity to free yourself and find life after diet to give you a hope and knowing that there's a future of this food freedom, this body freedom, and just free to be you and exactly what you said, live your life, right? I think at the end of the day, that's really what our context is all about, is finding that will and that drive and that confidence to live out your best life, whatever that looks like for that individual. So thank you. If you have any additional last words that you would love to share, if we didn't cover it, I'd love to just pass that mic off to you. No, I just, I I think, take the assessment and also check out our podcast, the Fitness and Sushi podcast. It's me and my husband together. And we talk about these things. We talk about healing. We share a lot over there about ourselves and about our ongoing journey and what that's like. You know, that podcast came about because that's what we were talking about. We were talking about our healing while we were actually allowing ourselves to eat sushi for the first time, you know, after years of dieting. So that is a great way to just kind of go and find out what we're all about too. And thank you. Thank you so much for having me and for you being so vulnerable and for sharing and doing everything that you do. I think it's phenomenal. Well, thank you. Thank you. So this has just been incredible. And of course, check the show notes, all our links and all the information where you can follow and learn more about Deanna and Tony, her husband's journey. So thank you for joining us. Hey there. Thank you so much for joining me on today's episode of the Confident Woman Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode as much as I did, please be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Thanks again for listening. 